My name is Steve Park, Associate hey, Professor in the Material Science and Engineering Department at KAIST, who will be the session chair of this session. I would also like to introduce Professor Jillian Biryak, who will be the co-chair of this session. In this session, we have invited the editor-in-chiefs of prominent journals, such as ACS Nano, Energy Storage Materials, Accounts of Materials Research, Nano Energy, and Nano Letters. In this session, each editor-in-chief will give a short talk introducing their journal. Following the talks of all of the editor-in-chiefs, we will proceed with question and answer session. And a majority of time of this session has been allocated towards Q&A session. Hence, I encourage everyone to post your question about the journal and the editor-in-chiefs will do their best to answer your questions. This is a great opportunity to really get to know the journals and to have your question answered. Also, please feel free to post your questions during the talks as well. That is it for now. And without further delay, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Professor Paul Weiss from the University of California, Los Angeles, who is the Editor-in-Chief of ACS Nano. Let's welcome Professor Paul Weiss. Uh, thanks so much for having me. I'm not sure if we're showing uh, the slides that we uh, put together or not, but I'll tell you something about uh, ACS Nano. So uh, we started the journal back in uh, 2007, and at the time we saw that there was a missing piece for the field, that there were a lot of uh, communications journals where people published, you know, a flashy uh, uh, something, but you really couldn't build uh, on the field uh, the way that it uh, needed to develop in the way that, you know, mature uh, sciences uh, did. And so uh, we put together a team as diverse in every dimension as we possibly could. Uh, we made it fun for ourselves and intellectually stimulating by having uh, arguments and, and frequent interactions. So I've heard from oh, about a dozen of our editors uh, just today. Uh, we have about 30 editors around the world. You can see them uh, in the uh, bottom right there, and uh, four of them uh, with us uh, today, uh, Ildu, including Ildu Kim, our host, and uh, Jillian Buriak, uh, one of our uh, moderators. Uh, the idea was that we wanted to lay out the future of the field, and so I put in green here uh, the idea that, that, you know, in many journals, you're not allowed to uh, speculate, uh, but we require it. So we want to see in a paper uh, why it's of broad interest uh, to the community. Uh, we want to see new insight and new discoveries. Uh, people ask, you know, how do you get a paper published in, in ACS Nano? And really it begins with the design of experiments in looking for or theory or simulations, you know, looking uh, where people have not before and, and putting together work that informs uh, uh, scientists, engineers, uh, clinicians, regulators across fields We've gone out of our way to connect to the, both the scientific and the public press. So we get several times the attention per article uh, that our uh, peer journals do. And then we also set the journal up to be fair uh, to the authors. We're all practicing scientists and we wanted the journal to treat our authors uh, the way that uh, we like to be treated. So uh, this year so far, I know that we've published over 500 articles uh, by corresponding authors who have not previously published with us. And it's one way that we judge ourselves is discovering new groups and showing them to the world. So we review every issue after it's published. We had one come out this morning, actually. Uh, and we have a monthly call where all the editors hop on. It's now Zoom. Uh, and then we go over the issue and the articles we published and make sure that we're uh, covering the fields. We do get many more papers uh, than we can possibly publish. That's more than 10,000 a year. I read and rate every manuscript within a few hours of when it comes in. I'm actually caught up right now. Uh, and uh, those go through our staff in North Carolina and off to the associate editor who will handle it. And any editor is allowed to champion any paper, but it takes two editors to say, we're not going to send a manuscript out for review. Uh, we have a robust appeals process that helps us in discussions where every relevant editor uh, reads and discusses a manuscript that uh, we've declined 
but nobody, it turns out, uh, peels any uh, accepted bakers. Uh, and so we really look for where the field is going and we, we very much like engaging the community. One of the most difficult things during COVID has been not being able to see you and have those, you know, the office visits and the times when we spend with students or, uh, you know, the hallways and uh, restaurants and, and, and bars around meetings where we talk to our authors, advisors, you know, would-be authors. And, uh, and uh, you know, we've, we hope that we're uh, serving the community. We welcome your comments. And of course, we, we welcome your top papers and we'll do our best to say not only where nanoscience and nanotechnology are going, but the impact uh, that they can have on other fields. If you saw my talk, you saw what we did for the Brain Initiative and the Microbiome Initiative and are now doing in uh, other areas. So thank you, Keist, for your very strong support and uh, the opportunity to uh, present and discuss the journal. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Weiss, for a wonderful introduction to the ACS Nano Journal. We will now proceed with our next speaker. Please uh, give me a moment to change the slide. Professor Beria, please introduce our next speaker. Yes, so I'm really pleased to introduce Huiming Chang from Tsinghua University in China, and he's the editor-in-chief of Energy Storage Materials. So while he's introducing, if you have any questions for the audience, please, uh, please add them to the Q&A so that uh, we, we can have them ready for uh, the open discussion. Thank you. Go ahead, Huiming. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so I'm Hui Ming. So compared to other journals, uh, the energy storage materials uh, is a, a newly born uh, uh, journal, uh, is, uh, <coughs> which is still in its infancy. We started the journal uh, at the second half of 2015, and then now it's uh, uh, almost uh, five years. Uh, so they <clears throat> published uh, 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 the number of published papers that is growing uh, every year, um, uh, almost double every year. Uh, and uh, we have, uh, as other journals, I think, we have uh, uh, much more uh, submissions than we can accept it for publication. So the energy storage materials uh, is a journal published by Iceware, uh, and also it is the first tier journal in the materials today uh, uh, <coughs> extended family. So I, I studied the journal as uh, the editor in chief, and uh, this year, uh, uh, since uh, <coughs> uh, July, um, Professor Patrice Sam uh, became the co-editor-in-chief uh, of the journal. So right now we have uh, 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 about 10 associate editors uh, from uh, Europe, America, uh, Japan, Korea, uh, and China, uh, of course. So um, uh, Professor Sang Kim from KAIST is uh, our associate, associate uh, uh, editors. So we are trying uh, <clears throat> very hard to speed up the editorial speed. So we will screen the submission within uh, one or two, uh, at most uh, three days. And also we try to uh, have the first decision after review within two or three weeks. Uh, so <clears throat> the a journal covers all the materials and the devices and the policies related to energy storage. So we also publish review articles, feature articles, 
uh, uh, original uh, research articles and also uh, short uh, communications. So I, I uh, welcome uh, your submission to our journal. Thank you very much for your kind of attention. Thank you. So next, Steve is going to do the next introduction. Next, I would like to introduce Professor Xia Xing Huang from Northwestern University, who is the editor in chief of Accounts of Materials Research. Let us welcome Professor Huang. Um, hi, thank you for having me. Can you hear me okay? Slightly yes. low. Can you raise okay. your volume? All right, so I will shout. <laughs> okay, so Hui Min said that his journal uh, is new. Uh, Accounts of Materials Research is even newer. <laughs> we are going to launch actually uh, next month. Okay, um, so this is a brand new experiment for American Chemical Society in many ways. Uh, for example, this is uh, the uh, pilot project for ACS International Collaboration, and in this case, for uh, with the Shanghai Tech University as a publishing partner. But editorial-wise, it's completely independent, just like any other ACS journals. So just like Accounts of Chemical Research, Accounts of Materials Research also publishes uh, concise, short personal review and perspective articles. And these are based on authors' own published results. Basically, you're using your, your own work to tell a story, to teach readers some new insights, and perhaps your foresight in a given topic under materials. And we are also not just limited to materials chemistry. We want to make this as inclusive as possible. So this is reflected in our current uh, editor teams. So we're very fortunate to have uh, Professor Yulin Chen from University of Oxford as a, a senior editor. Uh, he's an expert in quantum materials. So he will be mainly handling uh, manuscripts and proposals in materials physics and quantum materials. We also have Professor Yang Xiaohong from MIT as, an, uh, as another senior editor. She's a well-known uh, expert in energy materials and electrochemistry. So she will be handling material uh, manuscripts and proposals in catalysis and energy materials devices. So other than account, uh, account articles, we also have viewpoints. Uh, these are front matter pieces that we intend to use to address the broader uh, societal problems and impacts of material research. And we have some very interesting viewpoint articles lining up. Uh, for example, I can give you a quick preview. If you want to know what kind of materials problems there are in, uh, in money, banknote, okay? <laughs> Uh, we, will have, we will have a young professor who's writing this as we speak. And we have another viewpoint article that's been commissioned. Uh, this will be on the uh, materials challenge in water treatment, especially in uh, how to uh, mitigate the, uh, the problem brought by PFSA, those uh, now uh, pollutants that's uh, being, uh, being, a high, uh, being a big concern right now, especially in North America. Okay, we also would have viewpoint articles from leading materials educators to express a uh, collective view about what the future material science and engineers would be, okay? So uh, like accounts of chemical research, uh, most of the articles are by invitation, but we also have uh, unsolicited proposals and I read every proposals and we try to process this as quickly as we can, uh, hopefully just within a few days. And if you have a material story to tell, please do send us a proposal. And especially I hope that uh, looking, at, looking back at my own career, when I was assistant professor right before my uh, promotion to tenure, tenured associate professor, I got an invitation to write an article for accounts of chemical research. And that really gave me a fantastic opportunity to rethink about my research and to see my own research with a different angle. And I was able to share that with a broad uh, audience. 
So I'd love to be able to do the same thing for the young PIs, young professors out there, and also for even for graduate students and senior postdocs. If you have some thoughts, feel free to write to us. Okay, and we're so new. By the way, if you write to us now, I just got this T-shirt uh, got delivered to me from our colleagues in Shanghai. So uh, if you have a good story, let me know. I'll be happy to send you a T-shirt. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. So um, I'm not sure who, which journal we're introducing next, but while we have um, just a few seconds while the next slide is coming up, please bring your questions. So I uh, haven't seen any questions in the Q&A. So this is your chance to ask the editors in chief anything you want. They are here for you. So anything you want, um, happy to hear. So since we don't have any questions yet, you're pretty guaranteed that your question is going to get asked. So, oh, next, fabulous, the person you just heard from, uh, the editor in chief of Nano Energy is, is, of course, Zhonglin Wang from Georgia Tech. So all yours. Thank you. Uh, as the editor in chief of Nano Energy, I'd like to introduce a little bit about this journal. This journal was founded nine years ago. The first issue was January 2012. Up now is about nine years. And you can see the number of papers we published, for example, last year, 2019, we published uh, about, uh, uh, let's see, this, this uh, uh, last year we published about 1,007 papers. So on average that uh, we get a submission about uh, 5,000, 5, a little more, more than 5,000. So we have an accept rate about uh, 20 20 percent or so. So one after five papers got to be accepted for the, for the journal. We publish both real papers and communication papers. But in, in, in the most recent years, our percentage of real paper get low, and um, uh, uh, the uh, the because we have a lot of um, contribution from different. Uh, topics. So the impact factor of the journal has reached the 16.2 uh, uh, for last year, and which is a good encouragement for us. So we welcome uh, any manuscript related to uh, uh, energy and nanomaterials, especially related to uh, energy storage, energy harvesting, uh, power management, as well as wearable electronics, something related to s small powers. Uh, we do not publish many papers in the in the gigantic power, for example, uh, power plants or hydraulic power. We don't publish many pub papers for that. But so we welcome a broad range of papers covers uh, communication, new material discovery, even sometimes policy related. So so you can see this. The, let me see the, the next one. Next next slide. I have two slides, please. Uh, okay. Okay. This shows that. Uh, how fast we process the the manuscript? Okay, you can see that this is our record for every year for the for the for let's let's say 2019. The the submission this is for the accepted paper, and that means the for the accept papers. How do we? Uh, we on average, we have four and nine weeks for the first decision. That means that you need to revise or, or, or after review. So very very fast, and then submission to acceptance is but. 8.8 .8 weeks, this acceptance. Then then a submission to first online is 10.8 weeks, and this is the final uh, publication for that. So you can see that we try to our best to publish faster, faster, and faster. So the, not only the editorial process, but also the 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 uh, uh, editorial members in the behind the scene, they do the production department, try to be efficient for that. So uh, this journal is faster rising, and all we need, uh, we welcome a broad range of contribution to the journal and hopefully be a platform for scientists to exchange ideas and also get their new discovery to the world. Thank you. Thank you. So we're just going to switch over to the next person and uh, Steve's going to do that introduction. Keep the questions coming. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. I would like to introduce our last speaker of this session, Professor Terry Odom from Northwestern University, who is the Editor-in-Chief of Nano Letters. Let us welcome Professor Odom. So I'm the last 
speaker for to introduce the the journal. So I assumed the editor in chief position at the start of January 2020. So it's been an eventful year. And 2020 also represents the length that Nano Letters has been around. So it was the first one of the first nanoscience uh, journals to um, to really led by Paul Alvasados and, and Charlie Lieber to really say that this is a new area of science and that we think it's worth uh, investing in. And so the challenge for the journal and the challenge for me is to say, where do we want to go next? So I've been excited to take over the leadership of this journal. I've also been interested in uh, creating a forum or a global home, as the tagline says here, for communications in nanoscience. So Paul Weiss had indicated when ACS Nano launched that there was uh, a need for full research articles. And now um, I'm here to tell you that Nano Letters actually needs, is going to be a letters journal. There was some um, uh, creep in the length of the manuscripts, which made some aspects of Nano Letters and ACS Nano very similar. But um, I think with the reduction of the content uh, where we want the, the work to be uh, very short, about 3,000 uh, words, and um, that we can handle the results rapidly. Um, so as I mentioned, it's a communications type journal. I also want to point out some differences uh, compared to some of the other journals. I won't go into the statistics because um, I think bar graphs uh, are, are, are good, but you've already seen some already. Um, we have uh, viewpoints, which are one to two page articles. These are new for nano letters. And we've had people like Fraser Stoddart, um, CNR Rao, these leaders in, in nanoscience and nanotechnology write their perspective of what nano will look like for the next 20 years. And so I would encourage you to, to look at them. They're, they're they're quite inspiring and they're short. So they're easy to write and they're easy to read. And um, we've had very good uh, contributions. Uh, we've been, I hired new uh, associate editors. They're all young, meaning they're, I don't know, in their 40s, 30s and 40s. Um, Drama Nam is um, from Silver National is a new uh, associate editor. Uh, Chihua Zhang, now at Tsinghua University, is a new editor, Vicky Colvin at Brown, and Jen Dion at Stanford, just to expand the areas that um, we would like to see submissions in, and also to double down in areas that we're quite uh, good at. Another distinct aspect of Nano Letters is that we have an early career board, and this uh, board um, meets um, monthly, but they are publishing uh, perspectives on and putting together virtual issues. So they are the, the champions of the next, uh, their next generation of leaders in nanoscience and nanotechnology, and they're, uh, they're ambitious. It's been actually quite fun to, to work with them. Um, and they're uh, from all over, all around the world. Um, and they had been pushing me uh, gently to try to have some sort of uh, virtual forum for these uh, lectures, some global lectures in uh, nanoscience. And I wasn't sure because there are a lot of these um, seminars, but then uh, Yi Tsui, is, uh, he also spoke as part of the Kai Symposium. He is the new executive editor of Nano Letters just as of September 1st of this year couple weeks ago. And he and the early career board have put together this uh, nanoscience global lecture series, uh, which will start on Friday. And so the link is a little funny here, but um, I would encourage you to, to register. Uh, I think it's going to be a great inaugural event with uh, Steve Chu, who is a, a Nobel Prize winner, as well as Paul Alvasados, the founding uh, editor of Nano Letters and uh, Laura uh, Liu, who is the um, 2019 Nano Letters Young Investigator uh, Awardee. So I feel like there's a lot of new faces at Nano Letters, and there's a terrific team of editors that are handling your uh, papers. All, editor, all papers are reviewed by two editors. I have been reviewing every single submission, and then the 
uh, and providing comments, and then the associate editors will make the decisions uh, on those. So please register for the global lecture series. I think it's going to be uh, another good one, similar to the KAIST one. Thank you. That's, that is excellent. Thanks so much, everybody. Uh, we have questions coming in, and so uh, the way it's going to be working is that with the two session chairs, we're going to be alternating questions. So, uh, Steve, if you like, I can go with the first one from uh, one of uh, the Kai students. Great. Okay. Please go ahead. So, Jaywan An has asked a question, and, I, and I've seen this person asking a lot of questions, so thank you very much. Um, this person writes, thank you all. In light of COVID-19 pandemic and difficulties, what kind of efforts are you making to address the needs of your readers as an example, accessibility? So would anyone like to start with that? So publishing in the pandemic era. Yeah, I think I can uh, take that one on. So all the ACS journals have been made available uh, through devices. You just have to log in once and say uh, where you work and you have complete access to all uh, ACS papers. Uh, we also, uh, for all the journals, decided that uh, if additional experiments are requested from referees but are unlikely to change the conclusions of the papers, then we will not require the uh, authors to do those uh, additional experiments. And we publish an editorial in all the journals uh, along those lines, and all the editors in chief uh, signed that, you know, agreed and, and signed that together. Uh, you know, as we discussed before, one of the things we worry about is uh, connecting uh, with you, our, our authors and readers. And so we've been looking for opportunities to do that. I heard about the uh, global lectures uh, at ACS Nana. We've teamed up with the ICANX lectures that are given every Friday evening out of Beijing. We get, you know, something north of 300,000 viewers every week. Uh, we've been featuring our editors and editorial advisory board members and our a rising star lecturers uh, who uh, also form a junior board there. And I know each of the journals is looking for how we replace, you know, those, those interactions where we get to talk to you. And, you know, very importantly, you know, one of the things about visiting so many uh, places is to discover the young uh, groups coming up. And so we've tasked our editors uh, with helping us identify around the world uh, the, the you know, starting up and rising star groups uh, that with, uh, we, with whom we should connect. And so we always welcome, you know, communication from you and advice and, hey, you know, have a look at this, uh, you know, this uh, uh, work you should think about publishing. Oh, you're uh, muted, Jillian. Thank you. So thank you. Um, oh. uh, anyone else want to add something to that? Feel free. Yeah. yeah, I just want to add one. Uh, so I think uh, because of the COVID-19, uh, you know, scientists ha have more time to uh, think their research uh, and uh, their research directions. So I asked uh, some uh, active scientists to r r write some review articles and feature articles in their research directions. So, and keep them busy. Good point. Anyone else? Okay. Uh, Steve, you can ask the next question if you like. Yes, I will. Um, so I will ask a personal question that I believe that many people are curious about, which is the selection process of each of the journals. For example, uh, what do you look for in a submitted article? And any of the editor-in-chiefs can feel free to jump in to answer this question. Thank you. Terry, you want to go? Sure. Oh, sorry, uh, so, sorry oh, yeah. I go Zhonglin Wang, but uh, sorry. Why don't Terry start and then we'll go Zhonglin. Thank you. I think for nano letters, the chief criterion are novelty and significance. I mean, we, we trust the authors to submit technically sound papers. That's not something we want to wring our hands over. But novelty and significance, it could be either or or both, um, is, is really important for us to say, yes, this is, uh, a, is uh, urgent and it requires rapid 
publication or it's sound work and then but maybe it doesn't need to be published rapidly it should be maybe published in a in a specialized journal um, but of course, everybody has different definitions of what novelty and significance is, which is why I provide comments on both criterion and then the associate editors make it the decision based on their own review of the paper and the literature. Thanks. John Ling. Okay. There's also a good question to ask uh, uh, what to publish, what not to publish, because as uh, uh, Terry said that we always look for uh, exciting science, any new ideas, uh, new methodology, materials approach towards the field because we receive a lot of manuscript and uh, in different different areas. And in some of the areas, most areas we can judge, but in some areas we could not. Some, sometimes we have to consult uh, the other people who, who in, the, in the field, such as like a theoretical computation, regard to that. But in any case, we always look uh, for papers which have something new, something we people did not hear before or read before so that so we can have a, a good story to present. So let's just say like uh, uh, we, we, we try to do that, but always uh, is, uh, is that uh, cover a broad range of uh, readers. You know, the, uh, we publish all kinds of papers is that we serve the community. We serve the community uh, with the journal. We also we only have about uh, uh, eight social editor plus myself. We publish a thousand paper a year and uh, receive over five thousand per year. It's a lot of work to do. But in, in, even though we we try to be uh, as our best to, to judge the best quality of science and make sure the good work go, get published. Great. Hey, I, I want to ask, yeah, I was about to ask you, Jiaxing, okay. because your journal's different because it's an right. account journal. So yes, yes, yes. Like so uh, account journal is very different. Um, we, well, we're not taking original submissions. So, so f and all the articles are by invitations, that most of the articles are, are like that. Now we do have a lot of uh, proposals coming in already. Um, I can talk about how we decide on proposals. So the most important criteria is really, you know, do you have a good personal story to tell in any materials areas? Like sometimes it can be a relatively, let's say, cold areas in metallurgy or in ceramic, that's all right. If you have a personal story that you can teach readers something, we'll be happy to work with you on that. Now, what do we mean by personal? Personal really means that the authors have credit in this particular field. Uh, you have to be the one or, you know, the group of authors will have to be the group that made the original discovery leading up to this account. So what we do not want to uh, see is that uh, people teaming up, trying to uh, force an account out of this, then in that way, it, it loses the personal appeal, right? So for example, you don't, for senior, uh, for junior PIs, junior professors, you don't need to tie yourself up with a senior name. So that may be to boost the uh, uh, inference. Actually, in several occasions, we actually recommended the uh, junior authors that, hey, you could just do an account by yourself. You don't have to tie your name to a more senior person because we want to make sure that this is, uh, this article account properly reflect your contribution. So when the paper is published, people get to know you, people get to know your contribution, right? If you think about why we publish and why we read papers in the first place, we want to learn something from the authors. And I think every one of us have the experience that when we read a really nicely written article, the joy out of that, right? It's like, wow, I wish I can meet this person tomorrow. Okay, in that way, you already get to know this person in a socially distant way, okay? And also, you know, across time. So we would like to create sort of like the environment like that. So people, you know, get to know each other and teach each other something. And I think that really goes back to one of the original purpose of scientific publishing. Great. Um, so we have uh, three questions uh, uh, waiting to be asked. So I'm going to start with the first one. So this is Dong Ha Kim. So uh, this person's asking, what is the role of scientific journals with regards to public outreach and public science awareness slash education? Big picture. Maybe I can uh, take that on first. I mean, that was one of the one of the goals when we started was to be the public face of nanoscience and nanotechnology. So we purposely 
purposefully reached out to uh, reporters uh, at you know, New York Times, uh, BBC, Xinhua. Uh, Il Du Kim has done a phenomenal job of connecting us to the and press when uh, several of us visited Kais years ago. We were on the front page of the newspaper and doing TV interviews and uh, his uh, most recent virtual issue with Kais uh, was on uh, national television, featured on national television. And so we've you know, uh, established credibility with reporters where you know, if I write to the Wall Street Journal and say, here's something you should be interested in. It's a, you know, a, a new development for, from Professor uh, Zhang-Lin Wang's lab that you know, could really be important in energy harvesting. Then we get a response. And when we didn't get a response in early days, you know, we were very aggressive about, about pushing that. But now you know, by not sending too much, uh, but, but choosing you know, and targeting very carefully, uh, we do get a, a tremendous amount of attention. And one of the things that we want is when people read the newspaper that they identify uh, ACS Nano the way that, you know, PNAS or, you know, science or nature, uh, uh, you know, are known to the public. And so I would say we're part way to that goal uh, and, and we track very carefully the press that we get and, and work very hard to make sure that uh, the papers we publish uh, that deserve it get attention and pay a special attention to to new and young authors i would say we we favor them both in the papers that we that we uh, uh send out for review and publish and also in the ones that we publicize we think it's important to get you know new groups uh exposed to the world and uh and often you know they're the source of of the new ideas that we want to uh, feature in the journal thank you Anyone else want to jump in? Science awareness, public science awareness education. Yeah, I can jump in again. Okay, yeah, so this is really just to uh, continue my introduction about the viewpoint articles. Um, you know, in, in the course of my own research, I sometimes I often come into, well, I, I found this situation. There is a materials problem that's extremely exciting, but it, it's not a mainstream academic topic. If you publish, if you have a research article on, on this, it, it's, well, in the past, it was very unlikely to get into these uh, high profile or high impact factor journals, including some of those in this panel, <laughs> okay. But these are tremendously exciting topics. So some examples, like I mentioned, is banknote problem. And in my own example, like the hair care problems, these are not like energy or, you know, some other <laughs> mainstream topics, but, it, oftentimes I found out that there are not many people who actually understand what the real problems are. So I'd like to use these viewpoint articles, inviting industrial mm -hmm. experts, to just explain it to us, maybe define the research problem. So that helped to better bridge the gap between real materials application and materials research in the lab. And yeah. by the way, I found out in Korea, people do this really well in electronic materials. There are super exciting problems in packaging and in some little details about display devices. I mean, I enjoy talking to, for example, people in LG display, LG electronics tremendously because I found out that there was just eye-opening. I have never thought about those problems until I meet those people. And if you look at what they publish, it's usually not in those super visible journals. So I love to bring the gap, like bridge the gap using account platform. Smart. Okay, Thanks. I would like to- Yeah. Um, okay. Go ahead. We Sure, we can move on to the next question, uh, hopefully, um, which will be asked directly by our audience here. So I will give the mic to Professor Hong. Hi, everybody. Uh, this is uh, Sungbom. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, so I have a quick question before I leave because I have a meeting at 1 p.m. Uh, upstairs. Uh, so one idea that struck me was about the, uh, the audience feedback after the journal paper is published. So for example, what what I think Amazon did well in the very beginning was to have this five star and as well as comment from the uh, buyers so they can they can uh, evaluate the quality of the product. But in this journal uh, uh, entrepreneur, I think that's uh, something that we are missing. For example, we have a comment uh, se section, but it's really hard to really comment on the paper that that's been already published. So uh, do you have any ideas or plans to implement that in this coming era? Because I think now younger uh, generations, they want to have more feedback or 
they want to see if this is really re reproducible or something that is not that reproducible. So by doing that, they can judge after the journal uh, paper is published. So uh, do you have any uh, ideas or comments on that? Who wants to tackle that? So just, just go ahead, Terry. Was that your voice? Sorry, I heard someone say something. No, that wasn't my voice. Okay. That was me, I'm afraid. Yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> okay, sorry. Oh, sorry, Terry, I was going to put you on the spot. Paul. You know, uh, Nano Letters and ACS Nano was so complimentary that, you know. Uh, exactly. It's basically the other. Just <laughs> um, so I will say, you know, we do have comments that we publish when, when someone has either an argument uh, that's of uh, interest to the community, uh, or uh, or an you know an argument at maybe against a part of a paper, or even an editorial. Actually, in today's editorial, we responded to several comments on editorials we published. Uh, we do uh, publish those, and uh, those are refereed like uh, papers. Uh, as far as you know, general commentary that follows a paper. We have not done that. You know, some of the, um, at least in America, some of the magazines that have tried to do that have seen just completely off topic uh, comments. And so the, the uh, uh, what the result is that the comments need to be moderated uh, by someone. So it's an extra level of, of work that, you know, <laughs> as a practicing scientist just you know, wouldn't have the time to go through all the time, nor do we have the staff to, you know, to handle those things. All the, you know, all the uh, uh, editors who work at all the ACS journals are always research active scientists, and only we make uh, decisions on papers. Uh, we don't charge for publication of papers. Uh, and so the, you know, the funds available to watch the comment in every paper just, I would say, aren't there. Uh, the way the system is set up uh, currently. That doesn't mean there isn't a lot of exchange. I get comments on papers all the time and I know the authors do. And I know as an author, I receive lots of comments on the papers we write. Some of them are even favorable. Some of them. I mean, this is something we wrote uh, an editorial in ACS Nano actually uh, probably over eight years ago. Um, the one thing that, that mass media has, has had to manage is that Oftentimes, the very first comment or the very first few comments, especially if they're negative, can bias all the subsequent comments. And so maybe you could do this if you were to uh, cloister them or hold them. Hold, you collect comments for two weeks and then you then publish all of them. So in a sense, they're, they're not biased by the first person who has commented. And generally, the first person who comments is someone who maybe angry or annoyed or something. So that's an issue. I don't know quite how to address that. Yeah, I, 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 Nano Letters has no plan to, to do that. But, but also, I think, it's, uh, I think it's a nod to short-term reactions. I mean, manuscripts can be done, you know, take six months, years of work to do, to write, to peer review, and then to publish. And then how can someone in within even an hour of reading a manuscript be able to write something that's uh, meaningful and helpful for, for the community? I feel like that in some ways short changes the, or, or, or undervalues the, the work that has gone in from the uh, author's perspective, but also the reviewers and the editors work. We're not perfect, we'll make mistakes, <laughs> but oftentimes the, and things do get brought to attention in other types of media. Um, but I don't know that the, the journals um, need to bear responsibility for all of those uh, opinions, I guess, or perspectives, given that we've mostly done the professional version of and really honoring the, the work that has been submitted. Paul, I saw. Yeah, I'll make another comment. And that is, you know, the speakers you see here give talks all the time. So we get feedback on our work from the questions you ask, and we take those into account when we write our papers. But there are people who don't get feedback uh, on their, 
you know, on, uh, by giving talks on their work. And, you know, I think that's a place where the preprint servers like Chem Archive and Archive and BioArchive uh, serve a role. Yes. If you put exactly. a paper out there, then, you know, people, if it's interesting, people will comment on it and you will get the kind of feedback that we get when we give a talk. Actually, other than our mathematician colleagues always post their papers, you know, years before they get published because the journals are so slow. Uh, but we put our first uh, paper out there with a group of about uh, 20 people, which is actually a subset of the entire authorship or, of a review we're writing. And it was a result, you know, we had a three hour uh, new collaboration meeting this morning uh, with you know, potential people who wanted to join our effort uh, from around the world. And that's a paper that ultimately, you know, is going to be an invited review that we, you know, hope we can publish and we'll submit it to ACS and we'll get refereed there. Uh, so, uh, you know, there, there is a purpose uh, and there is a way to get feedback if, you know, Shangla, I don't know how many talks you give a year and Terry, between you probably 200 or something, right? You get all the time, you know, on your newest work, you hear what people are worried about or what people don't understand. But, but that's an opportunity through the preprint servers uh, to uh, get feedback. Good point. Good point. Okay, that's excellent. Thank you. Um, so that we have two more questions, but um, Steve, just I'm going to, so Ildu, I don't want you to think that I'm ignoring you uh, because we'll, we'll, I promise we'll get to your question, but I'd like to ask one uh, from Parth Kelkar. And so Parth asks this very interesting question, which is for undergraduate and graduate students, especially from developing countries where publishing op open access and is encouraged, but funding is restricted. APCs tend to be a hindrance. Can the good journals make some provisions to try and ensure that finances are not a hindrance for quality publishing? So for open access, this is a great question. Anyone want to go? So the I don't, Okay, I don't have a good answer for that, but I can share my tricks as an author. Like in the past few years, I actually have published quite a lot of, like, I think a majority of my publications are open access, but I haven't really paid much or any at all. So my trick is, um, well, I, if, I, if my collaborators are willing to do it, I'll go, I'll go with that. Uh, the other one is that <laughs> I will select new journals, right? New journals, oftentimes new high quality, well, perceived to be high quality journals, because they oftentimes will give you uh, free um, access and, and free publishing for at least the first two years. For example, accounts and materials research now for the first two years, all articles are free. And we just had like uh, four articles online by now. They're all free to download and, and to publish, certainly. They're essentially open access, right? So this is basically how I am taking advantage of that. But this requires you not being tied up to impact factor and something like that. So yeah, we, we have tried like about five or six journals in the past few years. Well, it's a starter. Okay, Paul. In the developing world, I know ACS gives away subscriptions uh, to uh, you know quite a number of countries uh, where there are not resources to pay for um, you know to pay for uh, subscriptions to journals. Uh, for the journals that are represented here, at least there are no publication charges. But then you know the uh, usually there are library subscription. Uh, Start to the other end. Ever need a paper? Write to the authors. They'll always send you a PDF of their article. I've never, you know, I've never found someone who didn't want to share their work. And so, if you see something, you, know, you can always uh, access the abstracts and so forth. Just click on that little uh, envelope uh, link that all of us have at all of our journals, and write to the corresponding author. And in a few minutes, you probably have the. Uh, PDF, as well as a few papers that you didn't ask for. Good. These these tips are great. Steve, you can ask the next question, probably from your colleague. Okay, I will ask the next question from Professor Eldo Kim, our colleague here. Thanks for your kind introduction on your journals. It is very helpful and for understanding of the journals. 
The feeling on the rejection of submitted manuscripts is always not so good. It is disappointing. ACS Nano case, as I know, the acceptance rate is about 13%. I'm curious about the rejection rate for the manuscripts submitted by the editor-in-chief yourself in your own journal. 100% acceptance. I, maybe I can start. We're brutal to each other. The editors get papers rejected all the time. Uh, I'm terrified to submit to ACS Nano because I only want to send my very best work there. I don't want anyone ever to say, you know, this paper only got in because he's an editor. And, and still, uh, I think I had three papers rejected last year. I won't say which one of our panelists here, uh, but one of the other panelists uh, complained that 18 papers in a row were rejected uh, that had been submitted to us. Uh, you know, we, we uh, pride ourselves on being uh, tougher on, uh, you know, on each other and on, on top authors expecting to get really, you know, really top papers uh, to publish. And, you know, the paper, 90% of papers we get are going to end up in, you know, PNAS or FizRev or Advanced Materials or JAX or Nature Baby or something like that. And it's for us to choose, you know, which ones we think are most interesting to the community and really have the, the insight uh, that we want to share. And that, I would say, the bar is higher for the editors uh, than for, uh, you know, than for anybody else. And we take pride in that. And it, as I said, it's terrifying to submit it uh, to, to our own journal. As a result, I think we've all had papers rejected uh, you know, by each other. Our own journals, yeah. Who else? Um, so edit this, some journals call this a desk decision. Who else wants to talk okay. about that? Rejecting okay. without reading. Go away, we mean. Uh, yeah, so uh, for uh, uh, all the submissions, uh, I go through all the submissions and uh, probably we will have uh, the desk rejection around half. And uh, another half goes to other associate editors and uh, are also handled by myself. Some associate editors may desk reject some papers as well uh, after my screen. So we also have a policy for a uh, number of published papers for associate editors and the ed editor in chief. No more than two papers per year in our journal. Mm. 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 Maybe maybe I, can, I can say a few words. Okay, I say a few words is that uh, uh, we receive uh, 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 over, over 5,000 manuscripts per year. So in my hand, I look at, uh, first one, look at the repetition rate. <laughs> uh, sometimes I see the uh, paper that have 50, more than 50% repetition rate. Today I saw one have 91%. That's the, that's the highest I ever saw. With such paper, I just reject right away. Okay. So when you say repetition rate, you mean like a authenticate type of yeah something they call, checking software? Yeah, software automatically check that thing, the repetition rate. That's the first thing I check. The second thing I check is that is uh, as a chief editor, is, uh, is this the area we are covering we receive a paper for example they trial they submit really the, the the electronic design for power line that's not what we cover so this paper is a special area where we got reject it's not a quality workers but just the not area we are specialized the third thing we look at as is uh, does the paper have anything significant? Because we only have a limited uh, number of social editor and also the referee. Everybody's tied up with review paper, uh, re review papers, and uh, so we just uh, 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 the uh, uh, if those paper does not meet our quality, we just reject right away. And I think uh, overall rate uh, we have uh, about forty some percent of test rejection rate, uh, reject rate. The rest of course, the social editor, they, they have a second screening, and then after that, that's referee. And uh, I do notice a phenomenon in the last few months. There's a lot of review papers submitted. And normally, we require review paper to be uh, rather proposed to us, but we don't. But I think it's probably 
is uh, is uh, but for the review papers, I check a couple of things. I check what is this the leading author? Does he or she publish many papers in the field? Sometimes I just find uh, from the reference they cite, the only one or two among two hundred reference, reference they only cite one or two. That means he or she is not really do much in this field. If he, they write a review. I don't weigh that too much. I don't weigh that too much. So such reviews is probably uh, sometime the uh, by uh, the junior members and get all the, the 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 information together and write a review. So such one I tend to have a higher rejection rate because I think if we have a published review, we want need the expert in the field so the readers can really catch the frontier of the field. So that's the things I, I use myself as well. And plus, the last one, sometimes you get a paper, they supposedly only have, uh, should be finished by five, six figures, but they have 15. And one piece of this, one piece of that, that one I just reject right away because they didn't put much effort as the data. <laughs> and also, do you look at the things that, that they sometimes put a figure? Let, let me tell you one example. Uh, my training is my cosmos, so I look at those pictures. They got a, a four or five SEM image. They didn't even didn't rotate the orientation, just based on the, the scale bar from the machine. It's on. They didn't bother to, to, to unify the things. That means they didn't put much effort to process the data. In such a case, I think it does not meet our I just reject it, by the way. Yeah, as I make this joke that that's it's kind of serious that the way you present your paper, it's a bit like dating. Okay, so I haven't dated in a while, but you only have one chance to make a first impression. Right? You no, know, you're going to go out, you're going to meet the person, you're not going to show up in your dirty lab coat, you know, you maybe you've done your hair or whatever. I don't know. What you're <laughs> maybe doing. that's okay. But you've got your one chance. And this yeah. is your data that you worked hard to present. So, yeah. and, I mean, the one thing I, I, I don't want, I can say categorically is generally papers we see from Korea are just so beautifully presented. Um, the graphics tend to be very clean. So, um, perhaps not an issue with the KAIST audience, but, but still. One chance, one opportunity for that first impression. <laughs> I mean, we're all human, and if the data looks clean, um, if, if the data looks, looks like it's been well presented, people will then go, hey, we're, we're, we have bias, we'll go in with a bit of bias on, on the side of the author saying, well, if they work so hard to make the figures look nice, and clean and easy for me to understand, maybe then they, they perform their scientific experiments with as much care. So yeah. we're all humans. Yeah, definitely. So uh, for accounts of material research, right? Again, it, it's a different journal, it's account journal. So, uh, so far, uh, most of the rejections can, proposals can fall into a few categories, right? The first type is just, complete mismatch, right? For example, somebody was sending an original research article to us. So in that case, sorry, there's no yeah. way we can do that. Um, the, the other common reason is that maybe it's a topic that has been over reviewed. So we found a few cases that the author themselves might have just written some very similar reviews. Uh, in that case, we would like to see differentiate differentiate uh, so something different um, perhaps maybe a different uh, proposal different topic or maybe uh, a little bit later come back to us but uh, so far we have not used any rejection template i mean every rejection letter is very carefully crafted uh, with a personal reason and oftentimes we will work with especially if the author is a junior author um, we sometimes have postdocs or assistant professors. We, we will work with them uh, to maybe better define the scope and we kind of leave a C over there if it ended up to be a rejection. Then maybe come back to us a year later when you have more data, when you have more published results. So, I mean, again, we're trying to make this work because it's, it's going to be a, I hope this is going to be a home for materials um, researcher, materials people. So, you know, if it, it doesn't work this time and let's try again next time. Good point. Okay, shall we go to a new question? So, Steve, I think I, it's, is it my turn? I think it's, I asked the next question. It's your turn. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> so thank you everyone for a bunch of questions came in. Uh, I'm going to ask a question by Sean Park. And the question is, uh, so I'll just read exactly what's written here. Thank you all, I have one quick question. There are a lot of journals whose purpose and focus are pretty much similar. 
How do you advise your students when they choose journals? And do you have any specific standards when giving the advice? This is an excellent question. Who wants to go? How do you pick? How do you pick the journal you want to publish in for your work? Uh, well, Maybe I'll take it. Well, okay. Paul, go ahead. Paul, oh, Paul, go ahead. You start. Yeah, you start. Yeah. I'll follow. Yeah. yeah. I think uh, when a student approach me for the choose a journal, I think one depend uh, who are the readers who want to present the work. Is this related to materials, more chemistry, or physics? And um, the uh, the readers we try to judge. And that's that's more more importantly, say the students like to publish in the higher impact factor journals. Okay, they like they they because the high impact factor they get more uh, credits towards their career one way or the other. And uh, we, we do understand that. But in many cases, I try to convince them, this is the readers, okay? This is the readers, the group of readers. Uh, let me give you one example. Uh, we published a paper not long ago in a, a journal of applied physics. If you look at Imperfect, it's only about three or four. And I, was, uh, I tried to convince the, the students, say, well, this is a classical journal. This is published 1,000 paper a year, have a broad impact. and. Uh, we should touch to the field of scientists in applied physics. So that's how we try to convince them to do that. But more or less, students always tell them, I want a higher impact factor, just like uh, many, many, many of us face for that. But uh, we try to convince them to go to the right one. Thank you. Paul, I think you... Uh, I, I agree. I think you want to choose the journal according to the audience. You know, the you want the right readers to see your work. Uh, I, impact factor is nonsense and you should ignore it. You should find the, you know, find the journal that has the readership uh, for the work you want and that paper will get attention there. Uh, and you know, there's, there's no substitute for that. You can waste a lot of time you know, throwing a paper at a journal where it doesn't belong, uh, but it's exactly that. You're just wasting your time. It's better to target the paper to the right journal, uh, make it perfect, like you described, uh, Jillian, where every figure looks like it belongs in, you know, whatever the very top journal you admire is. And then that editor and those referees are going to say, you know, wow, this is really a fantastic, you know, fantastic paper that exactly fits our audience. And you won't have to go through multiple rounds of submission and revision and so forth. And, you know, I'll add one more thing. If the paper is rejected at one journal, you got some wisdom from the editors or the editors and referees. And it's really worth addressing every one of those comments. When we, when we uh, submit it, when we get a paper uh, rejected or declined, it's maybe a nicer term, uh, we tell the next journal, we sent it to, I'll take nano letters because we, we recently had a paper rejected there. Uh, we sent this paper to nano letters and here's what the referees said, and here are our replies in detail to every comment, uh, because you know we took into account what we learned from that submission to Nano Letters, and as a result, you know that paper got published very very rapidly uh, where we sent it. We you know we still thought it belonged to Nano Letters, but but it, it was the judgment of the editors based on what the referees said, and we respect that, but we also learned something from submitting there and from the wisdom we got back. So I always advise tell, telling a journal that you know you sent it somewhere else first and responding as if you're writing a response to the original journal, send that to the next journal, even if it's a different publisher and they can't figure out who the referees are. One thing that often happens with a you know paper that, that goes out again for review is it'll go to the same people. And so, as referees. And so, you know, the paper will come back, hey, I told, you know, I told them when I reviewed this in Anna letters that they were wrong about this and they didn't change it, right? And that <laughs> infuriates, that infuriates. Well, yeah. mm -hmm. I, I had to go the other way where at PNAS I said, I told Science and Nature to publish this paper. You know, when I, when I reviewed the same one uh, three times, I thought it was a fantastic paper. So, you know, good, good news for PNAS that they got a great paper. Uh, and so I think take every piece of wisdom you get seriously and address it. And I, I just feel like you're better off at taking it head on and saying, here's what we heard before and here's 
you know, here's what we, how we changed the manuscript as a result. I mean, I just want to agree with what Paul and Ziella have said about readership, but I also, I mean, this is how I think about it, because who, who, who will appreciate the work and where have I appreciated the experience of having my paper published? So some places that you can submit, you know, it's just a very unpleasant experience from the first submission to the, to the, how the reviewers treat you, to how the editors treat you. So having, feeling like you're being taken care of in the submission process, I think goes a long way towards building, you know, loyalty besides just the readership. But I do have to acknowledge, and I don't know if this is part of the root of your question because I'm dealing with this right now. I have uh, an idea where we want to submit the paper, but I have postdocs uh, who are looking for positions in Korea or China uh, or students looking for positions in Korea in this case. And they tell me that there's this scoring system based on where you've published and that it only lasts sometimes for three years. <laughs> so there's like a window of time where you can publish before they can apply for a job. So that puts a lot of pressure on, on, uh, on students and it puts a lot of pressure for sometimes papers to end up in, in journals where the scope is not Great. So it might not receive the attention for the community, but it does receive the attention of the hiring committee. And that's just, it's challenging, but I think it sort of needs to be acknowledged. It's a, it's a, it's a challenge. I mean, as, as, an, as faculty, you know, we can, our, our careers are mostly set or mostly fine. Um, we want the students to publish the very best work, but at the same time, um, there is pressure, acknowledged pressure on the, the students for forces beyond their control, which, but hopefully that we as editors can help educate our peers and the community on how best to maybe evaluate candidates. So that's something that actually we can do in terms of outreach instead of just relying on simple uh, metrics for evaluation. Yeah, one point I'd like to add is that uh, uh, we we'll always have some desk rejection for that. I tend to be fast on that. And uh, as an author, we, oh, for us, we write paper too. Some of the journal take the paper for three or four weeks. They say, okay, we, we reject uh, like a desk uh, rejection. And, you know, I, I, I personally think it was way too long for three or four weeks before they make a desk rejection. So from our side, from the journal side, I tend to be, keep that a few days a few days after submission. If you think this should go to the other journal, tell the authors quickly. Then maybe we'll not feel that mad. If I hold on for three weeks, I bet they can feel very mad about that. Exactly. Yeah, fast turnaround, yeah. that first decision, yeah. agreed. So faster, yeah. faster and fast. Yeah. 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 I would like to ask uh, one question by Dong Guan Ha, which is a similar question to the other uh, person that asked. And it is also, I'm also curious about the peer reviewers. How do you handle the suggested reviewers? If you filter them, what are the guidelines for filtering them? I think this is a great question. Please, uh, if anyone can tackle it. How do you choose peer reviewers? Uh, I'll maybe start with what we learned from the suggested reviewers. So from the suggested reviewers, we learn at least two sets of things. One is what the authors think their paper is about, because presumably they're choosing referees relevant to the work. But we also learn something about them because we always look at who has you worked in the field, and if we see that they're choosing their collaborators, their mother, their aunt, their <laughs> cousin, uh, then we think less of them. And so it's really important to choose independent referees. Uh, what we tend to do is, you know, we have editors who know the field so well, they can generally go to, you know, editors with experience. And, you know, a lot of journals have had to give up on senior authors. We've never uh, had to do that. So our fastest turnaround paper ever, uh, we had five National Academy memberships between the referees, and it took us 26 hours 
from submission to get a decision uh, to the uh, author. And so we learn both, you know, sometimes uh, authors choose just the perfect set of independent referees and we'll follow their advice in those cases. Other times we ignore in terms of who we send the paper to all of the suggested referees, we might learn something from the list about who they, you know, what the paper's about. So it, the answer is, it depends. Now, I, I go through the same process when I choose referees for our paper, suggested referees that I use as if the paper was submitted to me. So I take what I think the paper's about, I type in the keywords, I go to the, you know, what I think are equivalent journals and see who's published recent papers in that field in top journals. Go ahead, we okay. Yeah, so basically uh, I choose reviewers uh, uh, three ways. The first, of course, uh, I choose from those I am familiar uh, and also I know uh, the, the person is very good at the specific uh, research direction uh, which uh, I want him or her to review the paper. The second one, uh, in our editorial system, I can just uh, uh, very easily to look for uh, those uh, who published uh, similar work recently. Uh, uh, and also I, I can know uh, uh, how, how many papers uh, in the same, uh, similar topic he or she published. So then I can choose the best one for review. The third one, Although we use the double blind system for uh, uh, our journal, but uh, sometimes I, I look for the suggested two, uh, no, I, I look for the suggested uh, reviewers from two similar uh, submissions. I just switch, switch the suggested reviewer to review other one. So in this way, I can uh, avoid some kind of, you know, uh, uh, yeah, I'm fair uh, reports or comments. This is the three ways I choose. And then also the submitter is doing the service of being a reviewer. <laughs> That's the benefit of your third option, right? But I, I also want to uh, follow up on what Paul said that what you can learn, I feel like um, and this is especially for, I've noticed this for some countries where the reviewers are only from that same country. And that, that's sort of an immediate flag, partly because it indicates to me that they, um, they either don't know the field well enough or they just have been a little bit, because the field is, is global. It's not just within reviewers from a single country or they just have not taken the time to really think about who they would like to have reviewers and it might be relations. But the other comment I wanted to make is that in terms of who we don't ask, if in your cover letter, cover letter you put reviewers that you don't want us to uh, send them to, we usually won't unless you, put, unless you try to exclude the whole community. But if there are one or two people that you feel like has a conflict of interest for reasons you articulate, we will generally honor that request. Great. Following up very briefly on what Terry said is one way we try and cross pollinate the world is uh, editors are not allowed to handle papers with any co-authors from their home country. And the exception for now is the US, but in certain areas, we've been able to move all the uh, papers off to be handled by editors in, you know, and not, not in the US. Uh, but in general, for instance, Jillian, if there's any uh, Canadian author, she's not allowed to uh, serve as the editor for that. And in some communities, there's been a division. For instance, we had a situation where in a whole field, uh, Asia and the US had one closed community and Europe had another. And so we worked for five years uh, with one of our editors, Andrew, we through a series of symposia, bringing those two groups together. And every time we got a paper from one community, you know, we'd have the other one review it uh, and eventually publish the forward looking review article with everybody, just so, you know, everyone would acknowledge each other's work and, you know, help, help uh, build a bridge that way. Uh, Cause we saw this flaw in, uh, in, uh, in, 
and break in the scientific community. Great, any other comments about reviewers? It's a good question. So don't just suggest George Whitesides, Chad Merkin, and Jean Ling Wong as your <laughs> reviewers. <laughs> They're probably busy too. So you can help them. Um, so we have a, a, a bunch of different questions. Um, so one question uh, that someone asks about uh, review papers. So maybe Joshing, this would be a good one for you. Review papers are helpful to understand a particular subject and it seems they help increase impact factor a lot. Do you have any standards or procedures including more or less review papers in your journal? So actually this is open to everybody. But right. Joshing, so, you can start. Yeah, for, for accounts, it's, it's not a directly relevant question because right. all articles are essentially review type or perspective type. Um, well, but, <laughs> but what are your standards for? Standards for um, early on, as I mentioned, that uh, we are looking for good stories that can teach people something. Yeah, stories. So if I expand on that, I was trained in chemistry. All my degrees were in chemistry. My undergraduate degree was something called a chemical physics, and a PhD was in organic chemistry. And now I'm 100% in material science engineering. But I started to appreciate a lot more about other, maybe not so much chemistry type of material science, like electronic materials, structure materials, metals. And I certainly love to include stories from those areas. Although superficially, they may not be able to generate a very high impact factor just because there's a relatively smaller number of people working in those areas. But I think there are tremendous opportunity if, for example, the um, um, uh, materials chemistry area can truly learn from those areas and catalyze the interaction. And I think there are a lot of exciting discoveries waiting to be made. And this is something that reading well-written review articles or personal review articles can help to contribute. So one quick example is that one of the uh, uh, EAB members uh, is a Professor K. Lu in Shenyang Institute of Metal, actually Hui Min's colleague. So he just won his a Future Science Prize. Uh, he's the uh, Physical Science Awardee. He actually is personally, he's very busy right now. He's actually leading uh, the Liaoning Province COVID-19 task force right now. But he's actually writing this article over the weekends himself uh, to teach the readers about a gradient nanostructure and metal. That's something that I believe most chemistry students probably have never heard about. But I think the underlying idea is uh, going to resonate with uh, colloidal nanochemistry. So I hope something like this um, can really help to catalyze new ideas and interactions, even if we're just a review type of article, uh, journal. Okay, thanks. So I, uh, I just got a note that uh, we need to start to wrap up. And so um, I was wondering if all the editors wanted to finish with something inspirational. We're in the unusual times. And so anything you want to say to uh, our 112 participants? I think we're thinking. To reach out, I would say. Yeah, reach the, out. The time when we would normally uh, get to see you at conferences uh, around the world. And if there's something you know, we'd like to share or you have a question, then, you know, don't, don't be shy about writing to uh, any of us uh, when you, you know, when you uh, have an idea or need some advice or uh, have an, uh, a suggestion for us. We really appreciate it. Great. That's a great one. Because uh, I think there still is a sense that the journals are these fortresses and you have to kind of bash your way in, but we're scientists too. All of us, we're all practicing scientists. So we are you, you are us. Yeah. I kind of like to say a couple of words. I think of this, uh, during this very difficult period of time of pandemic, the scientific uh, exchange and it got uh, hugely impacted. Uh, many people like us, we, we meet in conferences, we have a couple of tea together, talk about the science. And this is a restrict for this year. And we can only sit in home and go through online meetings for that. I hope that we should continue to push forward science for the world, is, is for the humankind. It's only through the, 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 the effort of the scientists around the globe we can solve many, many, many issues face our in the future. As, a, as, as one of the important key, scientific publication is the key for, for, for information exchange. 
more importantly, these online meetings is important as well. So I think we hope that we continue on this 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 uh, huge challenge, face this huge challenge, and make a science to be uh, uh, serve it all for us uh, around the globe. That's, thank you. And I just got a note from Ildu. He says that via uh, YouTube and uh, a channel in China, there are 5,000 people watching. So, wow. Shishin, thank you so much. <laughs> they probably have to get a VPN to get and watch this. <laughs> well, that's great. Uh, any other messages? You've got a big audience right now. We have five minutes. Anything oh, you want to say? I'll pop in a sen one sentence. I, I would say that... Um, uh, don't give up learning. We can always learn something new, and learning really empowers you through uncertainty. It can guide you through uncertainties. New. Anyone um, else? I'll just yeah. add just to. Oh, go ahead, Huiming. Yeah, yeah, you go. You go ahead. Ladies first. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just an encouragement to be patient with yourselves, you know, to have some forgiveness for yourselves and others. Yes. Uh, it's. It's easy to, on a Zoom call, put on your best face for everything. And there's lots of things that you don't know that's going on with, with people. So I think, you know, just be, you know, provide, give some forgiveness for yourself, some patience. But also, I feel like just be, uh, and you have to fight for this, you have to be grateful for these types of things. It's not a small thing that the countries are being suspicious of each other. We live in these countries. Um, and so what we can preserve in the exchange of ideas and the celebration of a common good, I think that's precious. And it's already being assaulted in other scientific domains. So I feel like uh, it's something to be grateful for, for the material science and the nanoscience and the things that, that we can do. But it's also, uh, it's a great privilege. And I think we have to continue to um, fight for it, but also uh, um, just be very appreciative. I'm just writing this now. In case people are reading the chats, I was summarizing this. But there we go. I hope I got your message, Terry. There you go. Great. <laughs> I think we have uh, run out of time. So I would okay. like to thank all of the <laughs> editor in chiefs for their time. I think your the information that you've shared today helped a lot of uh, people today. So thank you again. Thank and, you. Uh, we will conclude thank you. Thank this you. session. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Super. <laughs>